And it was my wife who dragged me into the antique stores. We would do these road trips, go around, and she liked to go to antique stores. And I had to find a way to and also enjoy the antique stores. So I started buying these old lenses, which unfortunately I couldn't use until I got my Sony a7R II. The mirrorless cameras with the right adapters will take just about any lens made for a 35 millimeter film. And so now I can go back in time to the 1940s and use, let's see. The lens made for this guy. This is the Argus C3 brick. Probably mm -hmm. many people haven't heard of it, but it may be the most famous camera ever made. Two million of these guys were made in, where is it? In Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is right over here. So it's kind of cool to have something this old that still works that was made in in the United States for one thing yeah. and in Michigan for another. So you can take that lens off that old camera and use it on your new Sony. Yes. Really? Here's the uh as far as being famous, here's the brick. Oh my God. Uh, the movie here one of the Harry Potter movies. So, I mean, it's, it's a very, I mean, two million of them. It's probably one of the most common cameras you'll ever find in a junk shop. Hmm. But it's an old range finder. It has detachable lenses. It had a whole series of lenses. I've managed to pick up two 50 millimeters. Here's uh, one of the newer 50 millimeters. You see the cursor move when I do that? Yes, no. yes. Okay. Here's one of the older 50 millimeters. This little stubby thing here is a 100 millimeter for the, the range finder. And this is a 35 millimeter. This was way back when 35 millimeter was considered really wide angle. Hmm. And they're, they're so common that, I mean, you can even get them in the original cases for 10 bucks. The adapters cost 20 bucks. So the adapter is the most expensive part of the deal. For reference, on the left and on the right, are the Canon 50 millimeter compared to the, the Argus 50 millimeter and a Sigma four Canon 105 millimeter compared to the Argus 100 millimeter. So right away, one, you can see that one of the huge advantages of using these old lenses is they're a lot smaller. If you want to take half a dozen lenses on a backpacking trip, you, know, you can take these little things. And if you like the, the quality that comes out of them, you, you're saving a lot of weight, a lot of space. This was a cute little thing. The, the way you had to adjust the aperture on these old things was press these two little tabs on the very front of the camera, on the very front of the lens. Try not to get your fingers on the glass and turn them. Of course, this is a very slow lens, a f3.5. But you know, it's, it's, it's for a rangefinder. It's for grandpa and grandma. They can't see very well. So the a depth of field of you know, f2, f1.8, it's not going to not going to do them much good, mm. but man, they're, they're quality. You pick these things up, they're, they're cast out of solid steel. And this thing has 10 aperture blades. The, the, the bokeh on this thing is beautiful. It's just perfectly circular and creamy. This is a hundred millimeter. It's just, everything about these is, is quality. I and mean, this is what, a 70 year old lens and a it's still still kicking, still in good shape. So I'll show you some of the stuff that I've, I've done with it. This was one of the first photos I took with a 35 millimeter. The issue here was the, the adapter. If, 
The adapters are hard to find and some of them won't let the lenses focus to infinity. And I didn't realize that was going on with this set. This is Marshall, Michigan. And just taking a, a view down Main Street. And it, I just like the, how the, the lack of, well, I shouldn't say too much because I, I edited this one to make it look older than it actually came out of the camera. Mm -hmm. But you've got the, the pretty sharp bit in the center where the, where the camera is in focus. So you've got all the, the detail there. And then on the edges, you've got mm. a bit of vignette going on and it's starting to get soft. And that's, that's pretty typical for all these old lenses. And I happen to like that. Some people aren't gonna like that, but you know, that's, that's totally personal preference. So this is that 35 millimeter old lens on your Sony. Yes. Okay. With this the right the adapter. Wrong... Sorry? With the right adapter. Yes. Okay. I had to buy a couple adapters and find one that would let that one focus to infinity. The well, 50... that's what... Yeah, how do you know what adapter to even get? eBay. You, eBay. Just keep you do a search. Uh, Argus C3 to Sony E mount adapter. And some of them, some of them will work fine with a 50 millimeter. Some of them, well, obviously won't work well with a 35. So it takes a little bit of experimentation, unfortunately. So is there a whole counterculture of people out there like you that take old lenses and do pictures. Oh yeah, I am, I am, just, really? I am just barely scratching the, the oh surface of it now. I had no idea. And you guys, you Nikon users, from what I've seen, the, the Nikon SLRs are better recipients for the old lenses than my Canon SLRs. It all has to do with the amount of distance between the exit pupil of the lens and the sensor. The, the Canon is longer or shorter. Now the Canon is longer, so it's, it's harder for it to get a lens that will focus correctly. The other issue with the Canon, the main issue with the Canons is that the old lenses have things that stick out of the back of the lens to mechanically change the aperture and the focus. And those things sometimes hit the reflex mirror, mm. which is bad. Okay. So I think the, the Nikons are a little bit wider so that that isn't as much of an issue. But with the, the mirrorless, you know, the, there's, there's no moving parts at all inside the mirrorless camera. So there's nothing for the, the lenses to hit. And plus the adapter puts the lens pretty far away from the camera anyway. Okay, interesting. So this is a couple of houses around the corner from where I live. I heard from one person that the, the insides are actually mirror images of the, the houses too. It's just a, this is a empty lot near where I live. And you can see the, the detail on the, this is from a 35 millimeter wide angle. And you can still make out the pedals and the, the center of the pedals from, from that, that was just handheld. This is downtown Kalamazoo. Back to Marshall. Yeah, this we'll talk about this one later and that one later too. The 50 millimeter, it's pretty much the same story. One of my neighbors. And again, with the, even with the at F35, you know, the, the depth of field is pretty shallow. So you've got the books and sharp focus. You can read all those titles, author names, and then fades off after that. And then he's got the nice twisty out of focus stuff when you get the 
Yeah. The combination, right. They, so that's the kind of stuff people spend a lot of time in Photoshop trying to mimic. Right. You're getting it straight out of the camera using right. these lenses. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go through these faster because it's taking up more time than I expected, which is, which is good. Yeah. This is uh, an old concrete kiln in Bellevue, about 60 minutes, 40 minutes east of here. It's one of the oldest structures in the area. It's a little park now. I only have one from the, the 100, but it's still, this is called Henderson Castle. It's a French restaurant bed and breakfast now. And this isn't the sharpest, but then again, I'm, I'm walking around, I'm doing this handheld 100 millimeter. So it's, it's still quite nice. So does your Sony have any in-body stabilization? Yeah, it does. Okay, so that must help when you're handling. It, it helps a lot. I mean, using these old lenses on the, the Sony is, is like cheating because you see the exposure through the viewfinder. You see the focus of the viewfinder. Not only do you see its focus confirmation, but you can zoom in through the viewfinder so you can focus on just a tiny area of the viewfinder to confirm that that part's in focus. And then you have the stabilization. So compared to what my grandfather was doing with his old Canon rangefinder cameras, it was just... Hmm. Now there are some turkeys. This one I picked up, this is a, a brawn for, the, for a Nikon mount. And I thought that it was Braun the Razor because it had the, the same kind of logo. But I found out that Braun actually made rangefinder cameras back in the, the 40s. So apparently they hung on for a little while and tried to tried to get into the SLR thing. And you had the, the reputation that old zooms stink. And this one is a pretty good example of that, no matter where you look on this, it's all soft. This is a 36 to 70 F35 zoom. And no matter how hard you try, you really can't make it sharp. So it's, it's I keep it as a curiosity as much as anything else though. Well, it gives you that artistic photography yes. blend, honestly. Oh, definitely. Definitely. You look at some of these places, again, I follow a couple art, artsy photography galleries and you know, this stuff is what you're showing is like gold to them. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's but not for I... those of us who like sharp, clear pictures. Here's another Made in America gem. This is the Claris MS35 in the 1940s and 1950s. As you can see, it's almost Make almost made out of just bent aluminum. I mean, this thing is heavy. And this is another interchangeable lens. And it's so American. It's not a 50 millimeter, it's a two inch lens. <laughs> and it does great. Uh, there's no barrel distortion, there's no chromatic aberration. It's, it's kind of stunning for considering the, the, the camera company went out of business because of their quality control snake. But and the edges, it's soft, of course. So what's and the, the f-stop on this one? It's really sharp. Um, mine's an f2. f2? Yeah. This is what it looks like wide open with backlights. Somebody was having a party in the cemetery next to our house. This is the receiving vault in the cemetery next to our house. In case you're not familiar, the receiving vault was a building built back in the 19th century 
before the advent of, of um, back end hoes, steam shovels and all that. They would keep the bodies in here during the winter until the ground thawed. And, and then once the ground thawed, they'd take them out and, and bury them. Or sometimes poor people, if they couldn't afford to be buried right away, they'd store their bodies in here. Hmm. They're thinking about restoring this one and turning it into a, I forgot the word, but it'll be a place where people can put the, their urns with their, their ashes of their relatives. Some, talk about them later. And then this is what I really like. This was one of the first photos I took with this one. And just the the way the truck just sort of comes off of the screen is it really impressed me. Unfortunately, a, for me, a 50 millimeter is not a, a good walk around lens, so I don't use it much. It's almost like that lens and truck were made for each other. Yeah, very much, very much. Go through a couple more of these. The the Helios is a fun one. It's 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 a German copy of the Carl Zeiss Jenna. We'll start with that one. So there's this is the camera as I got it from the antique store. This sent me back all of thirty bucks. And this is when I find something like this. I just pick it up and run through the cash register before anyone gets a chance to change their mind. But it's it's a fascinating piece of, of junk. The, the, the body still worked. The lens is in beautiful shape, but instead of having a pentaprism, you lift up this lid and look straight down. So it's um, not sure what you'd call that, but it wasn't really practical. It's a, it's a waste level finder, basically. And the, the shutter is rather impractical too. You kind of wind it, push the button, and two or three seconds later, the, the shutter triggers. So, I mean, people used to complain about digital shutter lag and the digital shutter lag had nothing on this thing. But this is one of those lenses where when you focus it right, the the background gets swirly, like this one. It's, this is straight out of the camera and you can see that the background is sort of almost painted like brush strokes. Then the sharp parts are, that probably wasn't my best example for sharpness, but, and this is. Oh my, that's very sharp. Yeah, Buds is out of business, sorry. Yeah. So the, the Helios was an East German copy of the Zeiss and they got it wrong, but apparently they got it wrong in such a way that it's it's another cult lens. If you look at, it, let's see if we can find the, yeah, this one. Again, you get the, the swirly background. I can find one that, that did it just. No, oh, I didn't get a, a perfect example, but. The, the germ, East German engineer screwed up the optics just enough where this becomes a, is it a, a cult lens? The, the center is very sharp. The background is, is beautifully out of focus. This is another $25 find with the, the body. On one, this one in the secondhand store in Vicksburg, of all places. Another one where I saw it picked it up, ran for the cash register, and, and paid for it before anyone could change their mind on it. 
do you find that when you, like you say $25, but if you wanted to turn that into cash on eBay? Yeah, that's a What would you get? It's a $200 lens on eBay. No kidding, okay. Yeah. This is another East German lens. This one, I did a bit better getting the, the swirl yeah. in the background. Devil Soup Bowl is a, a big hole in the ground, literally, left by the glaciers. And it's one of those lenses, it's very, it's a 58 millimeter F19. And it's very sharp in the center, and then very quickly gets soft mm -hmm. from the sides. So when you have one of these lenses, I got tons of questions on this because I think it's really cool what you do. So when you have that lens on your camera and you're looking through the viewfinder, you like you said with the Sony, you've got live view where you can focus in and that works with the lens. Yes. Wow. Because the live view doesn't care. Yeah. Whatever comes through the, the body, the light, it's what it's going to focus on. So you don't see, there's no like little dot inside the lens because it's really the camera that's making that happen. Right. Interesting. Yeah, this is Westlake in Portage. So when you focus that, <laughs> is there any indicator in the camera that? You know, your focus point is in focus or? Yes, okay. there's, uh, there's two things going on. One, one, well, both are optional, I use both. When you focus, there is a, a, a zebra indicator. The, the sharp, sharpest parts of the image are, have a red highlight on them. Okay, so it's and like then, focus speaking. Yeah, focus speaking, exactly. Yeah, that's the word. Okay. Yeah, and I wasn't then, sure if that would work with the old lenses without any electric. It has nothing to do, yeah, it has nothing to do with the lens. Nothing all, to do with the lens. Your body. And then once you've got the focus peak, I find it's not incredibly accurate, especially at the, the small apertures. Then you can zoom in just a couple button clicks and you zoom in and confirm that it's actually in focus. Hmm. Okay. That's really interesting. I would not have thought of that, that being camera dependent instead yeah, of independent. I came in a little bit late. I have a question. Yeah, sure. please. Uh, so are you building mounts for these? Are you 3D printing some mounts or how are you getting these hooked up to your camera? If no, they're all this different is, bodies. This is such a, a, a thing <laughs> now that you can just buy them on Amazon. Oh, okay. Just like a Nikon or a, or a, or a Minolta or whatever. Yeah. You just go in and search for, uh, any, any of the brands that you're looking for. Yeah. M42 mount is the most common that I use. Just search for an M42 to Nikon or M42 to Canon EF mount or Nikon. Okay. M42. While, while, you were, while you were talking, I did a search on eBay for mounts. And it's amazing. There's hundreds of them. Yes. Yes. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, for all different cameras, all different combinations. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. It, it works. It works like twenty bucks. Right. And then once you have like an M42 to whatever camera you have mount, then you can get a dozen M42 mount lenses and switch them out whenever you need them. So you just need one adapter. So you 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 convert everything to M42. It sounds like. No, no, no. I oh. have, I have uh, almost a dozen different adapters for whatever. Are you using a Sony use body? Is that what you said? Yes. Oh, okay. A uh, Sony full, mirrorless. Yeah, Sony full frame. Is it like a A7 III or something like that? Yeah, A7 R2. It's a 42 okay. megapixel model. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually good that you're asking these questions Joe, because I neglected to start the recording right away. And this is the part that we kind of lost at the beginning. So I'm really okay. glad that you're asking this. So now it's actually in the recording. <laughs> okay. Well, good. All right. <laughs> I yeah, didn't want to interrupt, but also I had a couple of questions. The, the no, keep mounts, asking. 
the different okay. mounts are for um obviously the the shape of the mounts are different like the m42 is a screw mount but the the distance between the sensor and the end of the lens is critical also so the the, the Leica mount from the 1950s was a 39 millimeter diameter screw mount. And the M42 is a 42 millimeter screw mount, but the difference in the distance between the end of the lens and the film is different. So they have to be different lengths. Otherwise, if you get the wrong length, it, won't, it will never be able to focus to infinity. And then the different bayonets. And then, then there's, there's two different kinds of M42 mounts. There's the M42 Auto, which actually was an early attempt to let you change the aperture from the camera. And then the earlier ones didn't have that feature. So you have to make sure the flanges are right. It's, it's, it's a learning experience, but there's all sorts of resources out there on the internet to help you get by. And there are um, online groups that do nothing but test different combinations and report the results. That way you don't have to, to guess, spend money and all that. Um, one of the most, I don't know if it's embarrassing or frustrating or what, you know, I, a lot of the places I go don't have cell reception, so I can't look up the reviews for the lens before I pick it up. So I'll get it home and I'll find out it's the particular lens is the worst lens ever made. It's not even fit to be a, a body cover, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> then you try it and you find out that, yeah, <laughs> the review is right. This is a, ter a truly terrible lens. <laughs> But then you get the weird ones like the, the bronze 36 to 70 that have don't even exist as far as the internet is concerned. And those are those are interesting finds too. It's an amazing different rabbit hole on photography. I mean, you know, you could just go right down the rabbit hole for years on this type of fun, looking for the lenses and learning about it. And that's really cool. It's very cool. Yeah, I've, and it's definitely entertaining to have, I don't know if, if your spouse is like going into antique shops or maybe you just like going into antique shops, but we like to go on road trips. She likes to go into antique shops and I was having a hard time with it, spending the time. But once I found out that I could get something out of it too, it, it changed the story immensely. And I'm usually the one who now who walks out with a bag full of junk. <laughs> Very cool. All right, from here, I'm gonna just, there's no easy way to segue. So I'm just gonna jump on to the, the next part of this. Okay, before you do, is there any other questions from anyone on the use of old lenses and, or questions on this at all? There's two places that I can think of out here in Utah. There's a old camera shop in Kanab that has very, varying hours. We went in there once on a weekend and they have just a, you, you know, you talk about like an eight by 10 room full of old stuff that this lady's husband ran a photography shop forever. And then the other guy is Mark at Colorland. Um, and I think it's what Tabernacle. He's got a lot of old gear too, but the thing there is they may know what their stuff is worth. Exactly. They exactly. do. The, you know? guy, the guy at Canab particularly knows how to price things. Yeah. Oh, yes, definitely. But it's definitely. an amazing shop if you're in the area to go look. So, Bill, if you ever do get out this way and come visit us, we'll definitely take you to those two places just so you can see what these guys know what they're talking about or doing, you know, what they've got for pricing and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we don't have a lot of, you know, antique stores, but we've got a ton of pawn shops. Yeah, that works too. I mean, technically an antique is 100 years or older and none of these places have that we go to serve and sell that kind of stuff. So they're, they're secondhand stores in, in reality, vintage yeah. shops. 
but they're just, you know, um, somebody's grandpa died and got to get rid of all this stuff. I have no idea what it's worth, but it's taking up space. Let's get rid of it. Dump it here. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this goes back to where I started. I like walking around and taking pictures. So when the Kalamazoo Valley Museum, which is this building, started asking for volunteers for their 10-year their photo project, that was a perfect fit for me. I did it in 2011. It was a good time. But basically, every 10 years, they want people to go around Kalamazoo, the area, a 20-mile radius around Kalamazoo, and take pictures to record what life was like. I mean, everyone likes looking at those old pictures of downtown black and white with the old trolleys and the horses and all that. Well, you gotta fast forward 50 years and imagine what people in the year 2070 will think looking at downtown Kalamazoo with those cars that people are still driving and have tires and polluting and stuff like that. I wonder how people ever lived like that. And what do we take pictures of? They, they said, take pictures of things that won't be around in 50 to 100 years. In this case, this church is gonna be demolished before the end of the year. So we need to take pictures of that. The first reformed church downtown is a, a landmark since the late 19th century, but it was neglected. It was originally wood and they put brick over the wood and the structure couldn't support it and there was no way to maintain it. So down it came. So we documented that. A lot of angry people in Kalamazoo about this one, but none of them contributed to try to save it either. So that's their own fault. A lot of people came out to see it. Take video that came down. Oh, wow. And then there's a surprise thing. This is a wildlife preserve about five miles west of Kalamazoo. Someone dropped a cigarette when they were visiting and caused the, the thing to burn. So got pictures of that. But then there's this stuff you don't know. Uh, this was taken during the pandemic. My wife and I were getting our daily allowed walking time, our exercise that was permitted by the, the government and walking down the bad part of town as some of the, the people around here call it. Took a picture of this place. It's condemned, but it was going to be refurbished into multifamily housing. And this is from the, the glory days of Kalamazoo, the 19th century, when the Dutch people lived in this part of town and the, the rich merchants and all that. This would have been a single family home when it was built. But uh, by the time July 4th came around, someone had burnt it, I assume for insurance money. Hmm. And it stayed in the pile for most of the summer, most of the year, until finally they clear that away. So it ends up, you go around taking pictures of, of anything and everything. This was the last video store in Southwest Michigan closed. This is history. <laughs> and the year started and so it, basically you take pictures of what's going on and show how the year went and our year started pretty normally at work we had a civilian response to active shooter events seminar so that if one of us went nuts the rest of us would know how to respond and hopefully get out without getting too many people shot the ice cream stores opened as usual. This is our, our favorite one. It's just a 10 miles north of Kalamazoo. My wife is here describing how she wants her ice cream in a bowl with a 
Cohen on top. Former co-worker selling Girl Scout cookies in the corner. And then suddenly there's a pandemic and the restaurants are having to close. Um, this is this was our favorite lunchtime restaurant. And you know, we spent a lot of money there drinking the, the last day. <laughs> And then the zombies came. It was sad. The streets were deserted. No one was out. This was the church I used to go to. This was the Easter service. Usually that parking lot would be full on any normal Sunday. They had to cut back on attendance. I think it was 250 people were allowed into the building. Then the restaurants started opening up for takeout again. The ice cream store stayed open. They moved the, the dining out into the streets. This is one of those expensive um, $200 a meal restaurants in downtown Kalamazoo. People are eating where they used to park their cars. Everybody was wearing masks, including the people on the giant hot dogs, dog walkers, tennis players. Working from home, this is my wife working with a, a client. These are the backpacks of students who are now studying virtually, but they had no Wi-Fi at home. So they went to the a local museum in the, <clears throat> this is in, the this is in Bloomingdale. Very small village. And a lot of the people didn't have Wi-Fi at home, so they would come, the students would come to this park and use the, the museum's Wi-Fi, recharge their electronics there. We had the protesters. We had some healing with, uh, we had riots, a lot of smashed windows, a little bit of healing afterwards. Uh, this is from the Juneteenth celebration. Uh, they put particle board over the smashed windows and invited local artists to paint. I love that one. Yeah, oh, they, you did get a drone shot of that. Wow. Right. This is in front of the library. And then Ben Carson came to town. I didn't see Ben Carson, but I saw his motorcade. <laughs> It's a pretty scary thing to be walking along and suddenly two dozen police cars are literally driving cars off of the street to get out of the way. And we had the elections, all sides of it. Kalamazoo is mostly blue. Everything around Kalamazoo is red. So do you think because of the project you were doing that a, you got out to shoot more of this kind of stuff than you would have on a normal year? Oh, definitely. Because okay. I, was, I was looking for excuses to get out because we're, okay. all, we're all indoors. And then did you feel that you actually had more of a poetic license to take pictures? Yes, definitely. Because cool. if anyone asks, you can say, I'm a volunteer for the Kalamazoo Valley Museum working on a photo project. <laughs> Okay, very and, cool. And once people hear Kalamazoo Valley Museum, they're like, cool. We were getting ice cream in Vicksburg and stopped to talk to these people. Of course, we had the ballot boxes. My wife demonstrating how to use the ballot box. All you can do is vote and drink, it comes down to. I met a lot of people too, being out, even though, you know, we're all supposed to be indoors. This is, again, the cemetery next to our house, a couple having a picnic there. Mm -hmm. This is the owner of the South Street Cigar and, and Spirits having a cigar out in the, the sidewalk. That's a fabulous shot. Meeting a neighbor. That's, that was interesting too, because I met more neighbors during the pandemic than I, I did during, during mm -hmm. usual times. This is a 
professor at Kalamazoo College and they have three greyhounds and they foster the occasional brindle. They like to have the brindles because the foster the brindles because the brindles go quickly. But the greyhounds get cold quickly too. So it's always cute to see them out in their pajamas. <laughs> This is with the uh, vintage lens, the old Wallensack Raptar two inch. These people are doing mobility training. Kalamazoo is one of the, has a center for blind rehab training. So a lot of times you'll see students out in the streets with blindfolds and white canes and trying not to get run over. That's their professor with them, making sure that they, they don't get hit. It's another little town west of Kalamazoo. This guy is a World War II vet and he's the owner of the Kendall store and he's just and he's pulling down the flag because it's gonna rain and then he knows that the American flag isn't supposed to be out in the rain. He knows how to properly take care of that thing but um, you stop there and you he'll show you all the pictures of Kendall, what it looked like back in the day when it had a roller rink and stores and factories. Now it's just maybe a hundred people, another ghost town. These people moved here from New York during the pandemic. They had a, a little theater troupe that obviously was gonna go nowhere with everything closed down. So they're living in her father's place, trying to sell their stuff to make some money. People rode their motorcycle uh, to the uh, this little village so they could ride their bicycles and asked me to take their picture. So I asked, they gave me their, their cell phone. I took their picture and asked if I could take their picture for the museum and they were more than happy to pose. This guy goes to the cemetery and puts flags on the veterans the veterans um, stones, markers. It's so probably 95 degrees here and 90% humidity and he's still, he's still at it. Garage sale guy. This was fun because this guy got into an argument with me about flying my drone downtown because he wanted to know if he could, he had the right to shoot down a drone with a bow and arrow, with his bow and arrow, if anyone flew a drone next to his house. And of course that's that's illegal, but he couldn't couldn't accept that. So he went off in a huff. Later on we met him at a that having his garage sale, started talking to him and he's just the nicest guy in the world. He was just having a sort of a bad day. And I, I recognized him because he has this, I don't know, this 10 foot tall dog. It's a big black great dane that he likes to take in but the dog likes to go in the water and blow bubbles in the water <laughs> just just silly western student all by herself on campus at thirty-five thousand. then there's the people who aren't quite so lucky homelessness is a pretty big problem in kalamazoo there are tent cities all through the winter. Mm. And I got to fly around and check out some of the abandonments. Let's see, I'll go through. This is, this is Kalamazoo. Construction was going on. This is Western Michigan University by drone. Wow. At the same hotel. Uh, Kalamazoo College was building their their natatorium. That was the word I learned last year. Natatorium. It's the word for a, the building that has a pool in it. And this was one piece of the the roof. So they used a crane to lift that huge thing on there, and it was just incredible. That weight must be huge with the number of tires on that truck. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. This is the Bronco Stadium for Western Michigan University. And then I just, like I said, just the typical stuff. For some reason, I, I 
I like seeing the rows of garbage cans on our street. So I took a picture of that for the, the documentary project. This is what this is what we did with our garbage in 2020. Got lucky. We did enough walking. We saw a couple automobile accidents. No one was hurt in this one, but apparently it was even though he was the only car on the road, apparently he was looking at his phone and drove up the guy wire of a utility line. Ended up like that. Roundabouts were the new big thing in Kalamazoo. We're putting in a lot of those. Any roundabouts in Utah yet? Yes. <laughs> yes. And they're not big enough. They're not why a personal opinion is they're not enough lanes because our traffic is very heavy. And sometimes they're only like a lane or two and you just don't really know where to go. People here haven't figured out how to do four-way stops yet. So roundabouts are kind of out of their league. So. <laughs> yep. And then sometime, if you really want to have a good laugh, look up double diamond as a, as a way diamond. to do a road. Okay. A double diamond. I, think, I don't know if they have crossover in that or not. We have a lot of double diamonds. Now, this is the cemetery next to our, our house. In our neighborhood, we don't have a park. So the the cemetery is the de facto park. People come and jog, walk their dogs in there, whatever. I, I use it to test fly my drones, <laughs> uh, test depth of field experiments, whatever. It's it's an old Victorian cemetery. It's got some, it even has a Revolutionary War soldier buried in there. Mm. A lot of history. The advantage to everyone being stuck at home was that you'd go to these places and take pictures of them and no one would bother you. So I got pictures of these adult entertainment places so that they can be recorded for posterity. And of course, John Lacko looks at this and says, well, did you get pictures of the inside? <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, John. <laughs> uh, that was see. his job. Center pivot irrigator in action. Do you guys have the, those out there? Yeah. Yes, we do. <laughs> we have to irrigate everything. everything. Yeah. We irrigate hay fields to grow hay. That was a new thing for me. Here's uh, Henderson Castle again. The, the, the French chef is trying to grow his own French grapes to, to grow his, make his own French wine. So I'm going to skip through some of this stuff, seeing as we're getting so close to the end. There was some, yeah, not really too much relevant, but. Yeah, the, the access that we got, that I was able to get to these buildings without any cars parked in front of them, without any people walking in front of them was, was pretty cool. This is the, the courthouse in Van Buren County. The museum had a list of buildings that they wanted pictures taken of, like This so church. How, how many Nothing. photographers were involved? How many people said, yeah, I'm going to go out and do this for them? Do you know? A lot. Let me take a quick look on Flickr and see how many people actually, I think only about half a dozen people, about half a dozen people actually turned in okay. work though. A lot of them I mean, it's, it's like any volunteer thing. It's a lot of people sign up and say, this sounds like a cool idea, but um, they end up not doing it. And then they, do they just archive them? Do they do any, do they sift and sort and? They're, they're in the process of reviewing the submissions now. So yeah, about a dozen people finally submitted photographs. They're gonna pick the ones that they find most relevant and then 
we have to turn those in as as um, if files. And they had very specific requirements. Title have to be a certain way. Mm -hmm. the, the date, my initials, six letter title and the sequence number. And then a description saying where it is, why you took a picture of it and all that. Like this is an old church in the, the Dutch part of town that's probably not gonna be here in 10 years, much less 50. Mm -mm. There's a congregation that still meets there, but from what I've heard, it's it, it falls apart as they're singing. But at one point, it was a, a gorgeous old building. This was interesting old place. The let's see, oh, there's a well-known Italian sausage place in Kalamazoo, and this is where they started. So that's that's a very significant building. Mm -hmm. There's a section in Kalamazoo where the old I think it's probably the first technology park, if you want to call it that, the first industrial park. The factories were built in the, the 30s and 40s and they were manufacturing for World War II. And the, the shelves are still standing, but it's a pretty questionable place to go yes. visit. But with the, the pandemic, it wasn't it wasn't quite so bad because everyone was well, I, I guess they smashed their car and they they went home. And they wanted pictures of this new sign. This liquor store has been there since the 1950s and finally got its neon sign replaced. So they needed a photograph of that. So I went to dark and on like Christmas Eve when everyone was buying their liquor and got pictures of their sign. Of course, the, the Christmas stuff. Kalamazoo went over the top um, as compared to normal with the, the decorations, with it being such a, a gloomy year. But there are a lot more decorations in the park than normal. It's very pretty. Wow, the, this is from my hometown. This used to be an old paper mill. Now it's the, the uh, city hall. And administrative offices. Hmm. And that brings us to the end of the year. So. so so after the museum judges these photos, what do they do with the winners? They put them into a database and they're hoping to make them available to the public. Um, I was, like I said, I was in the 2011 project. They still haven't finished that one. <laughs> so, okay. It's a long, slow process. It would be really cool. Like if they, like you said, they did it in 2011. I don't know if they did it any other years. Yes. Uh, John Lacko started this project in the 70s. So. Okay. But wouldn't it be really cool, like for Howard's liquor store to have like a book where, you know, you had, he had a book, photo book, and you yeah. had pictures of it through the years. That would be just so cool to see the change. Yeah. Of all of that would be Definitely. really neat. But again, that's a lot of volunteer hours. Lot yeah. Of I'm not sure if they're volunteers or if they're they actually paid staff. I think yeah. they're paid staff. So they only have so much amount, so much time to, to work in each one of those. Right. Very cool, though. I really enjoyed seeing these. I lived in Kalamazoo for almost all my life. So it's right. on the west side of town. Well, I'm on Facebook and all I do is post pictures I take around town. If you wanna if you wanna follow me, you don't have to send me a friend request. All my stuff is is public, so you can you just follow me. Well, if you don't mind, I might take your Facebook URL and put it on our meetup group so that people who are interested either in Kalamazoo like Kay is, or to talk to you or get to know you better about the vintage lenses. Yeah, that'd be cool. Um, I think then, then they'll have a way to contact you. Cool.
I, that was very good. That yeah, was thank interesting. You. I mean, I know I lived in Kalamazoo, so it was probably more interesting to me. <laughs> but I just like the whole idea of the museum doing this. Now, where we are at here, obviously, with the pioneer background from the Mormons, there is just, there's museums worth, like we have, you know, Daughters of the, um, you know, Utah Pioneer Museum that has old pictures from way back. I mean, it's, it, it's kind of cool to go see them. I like mm -hmm. to go see them. And then since we also had a lot of film industry in this area, if you watch things like The Electric Horseman and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, now that Bruce and I have lived here and other people who live here, if you watch those movies, you can pick out places. It's <laughs> cool. really weird. It's really kind of cool. It's like, oh my gosh, that's just, you know, that's Tabernacle or that's St. George Boulevard. And it's kind of cool. You don't even watch the movie now for the story. You watch it for the background so you can see where things are. <laughs> I do so, like seeing the, the pictures of the the old aviation navigation system, the, the old concrete arrows. The concrete arrow, yeah. 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 yeah, that's something that's, I mean, it was across the whole United States, but is unique to this area that we still have some of it. You had to have big stones to, to do that back then. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, no kidding. Any no questions kidding. for Bill otherwise? Those are the, that we're here, okay. I did record it. I'll get that out to everybody. And 